In 2004, Daisy Knight and Ron 3 re-emerged, more relevant than ever with the release of a pseudo-documentary produced by some of her students called What the Bleep Do We Know? But the bleep is written, it's supposed to be What the Fuck Do We Know? What the Bleep Do We Know? combines elements of documentary-style interviews, animation, and a fictional narrative to explore the intersections of science, spirituality, and consciousness. The film aims to bridge the gap between science and metaphysics by presenting ideas related to quantum physics, neuroscience, and philosophy. Directed by William Arntz, Betsy Chase, and Mark Vicente, the film features interviews with various scientists, philosophers, and spiritual leaders, including physicists like Amit Goswami and Fred Allen Wolf. The fictional narrative follows the story of a photographer named Amanda, played by Marley Matlin, as she navigates her personal life and encounters various teachings and ideas about reality and consciousness. The film explores concepts such as the observer effect in quantum physics, the role of perception in shaping reality, the mind-body connection, and the potential for personal transformation. It poses questions about the nature of reality, the power of thought and intention, and the possibilities of expanding consciousness. Without ever revealing that the documentary is simply the teachings and featuring interview clips with Jay-Z where she is credited simply as Ramtha, with no mention of the fact that Ramtha is an entity that Jay-Z Knight is channeling, the movie became a huge hit. It's an indoctrination tool using the science of quantum physics to back up Jay-Z Knight's teachings. The documentary focuses largely on the observer effect in quantum physics and how that scientifically backs up Jay-Z Knight's claims since the 70s that you are God. A common refrain was, if she wasn't channeling Ramtha, how did she anticipate this science? The answer is that she didn't. The observer effect in quantum physics have been around since the 50s and incorporated into New Age teachings since then. Jay-Z just packaged it better. Like me, you're not a quantum physicist. You've only blown one for several years. I will try to break this down into something digestible. Um, so the observer effect, also known as the measurement problem, is a concept in quantum physics that describes how the act of observation or measurement can influence the behavior of quantum particles. In classical physics, the act of observing or measuring a system doesn't inherently affect its properties. However, in the realm of quantum mechanics, the situation is different. According to the standard interpretation of quantum, of quantum theory, the state of a quantum system is described by a wave function, which contains information about the probabilities of different outcomes when a measurement is made. When an observation or measurement is performed on a quantum system, the wave function collapses into one of the possible outcomes corresponding to the measurement. This collapse is often represented by the term wave function collapse. The measurement effectively determines the state of the system. So essentially, to sum that up a little bit smoother, basically like a quantum particle exists in every possible state that it could be at various levels of probability. And as soon as you measure it or observe it and you're like, okay, wait, what, where are you exactly? Then it, whatever you measure it at is where it's at and every other possibility kind of falls away. And it's like, as soon as you look at it, that's where it is. It doesn't make a lot of sense. It's really hard. If you think it, if you get it and it makes sense to you, then no, you don't basically with quantum <laughs> physics. The observer effect implies that the act of measurement disturbs the system being observed. Prior to the measurement, the system may exist in a superposition of different states, like I was saying, meaning it can be in multiple states simultaneously. However, once observed, it chooses one particular state and the superposition collapses into that state. So it's like it's everything all at once until you look at it and then it's just one thing. The exact mechanism behind the observer effect is still a subject of debate and interpretation in quantum physics. Various interpretations, such as the Copenhagen interpretation and the many worlds interpretation, offer different perspectives on how to understand and explain the phenomenon. It's worth noting that the observer effect is not restricted to conscious observers. It applies to any interaction that can extract information from a quantum system. This means that even an automated measuring device or an interaction with the environment can cause the collapse of the wave function. Um, you get the idea. So it's easy to kind of jump to, we control reality if we can determine where a quantum particle is by observing it. But exactly. That's not, oh my God, we're gods because we can do that. That's just like, that happens. And like, it happens when anything observes it. That's just, the particle is really cool. You're not and that's that cool. The part, that's the part that gets left out of a lot of these new age teachings is is the part that it it doesn't require consciousness consciousness is not required to impact the wave function consciousness is not required to cause a, a wave function collapse 
What really? It, it, it can be it can be a machine doing the measuring. It doesn't have to be a conscious person. Yeah, which is to say, you can't cheat and like. Okay, I'm not observing you. This mirror is observing you. Like like with Medusa, you still get turned to stone if you're observing it through the mirror. Like the mirror is still like it doesn't matter. Yeah. And what really fucking pisses me off about this is that that alone I knew is this, so I knew this was gonna piss you off. Fucking beautiful <laughs> and incredible that we that this happens at all and that we have we observe it and we have any any possible concept of this the science behind it the the particles themselves like i was saying that's what's that's what's impressive that's wild it's amazing that we know this it's remarkable it's astonishing and the fact well, and that also, that's not good enough now you have to like take it and put it in some sh- chintzy fucking package about your spiritual like fuck you this is so cool stop shitting all over it with your god shit like let the scientists have their fucking moment they worked hard they worked real hard on this yeah and that's the thing i it's kind of utilitarian uh theory in sociology which basically says that you it's impossible to recognize systems until they bump up against each other so therefore things are inherently defined by their outermost boundary so kind of like the idea that racism as a concept is hard to understand until you experience it until you interact with institutions and you find the limits of what you're able to do and then you're able to comprehend this thing of called structural racism right Mm -hmm. and so it's that's the same thing as quantum physics and and wave function collapse it's you can't recognize certain systems until you bump up against them and then they become systems, right? Then, they, mm-hmm. then it becomes an institution. Mm-hmm. Like an institution doesn't actually exist, but the, the word is describing a thing that we all understand, which is like this collection of things that happen all interconnected to create a culture and a, a community and rules and norms that dictate a, everyone's experience. Right. And it's it's so even as a sociology person, I can look at it and be like, oh, it's just like it's just utilitarian theory. It's like, yeah, you, you, you can't you you find out where you exist by experiencing your boundaries. Right. Like, wow. Yeah. In so many ways. Like. A blind person. Right. Mm-hmm. Like by where your hand touches something is like where you are come to know the space. And it's like the particles are just doing the same thing. Right. Like there's a measuring tool. Like now I'm contained. Yeah. It's kind of like some of the stuff that I did with the early VR stuff, the uh, telemetry and stuff. Me trying to talk about science is like the funniest shit ever. (laughs) This is important to me here. The observer effect in quantum physics was first described and discussed in the early development of quantum theory during the 1920s and 1930s. This is important because so many people describe Ramtha as describing science far before it was in the mainstream. But this discussion this started in the 20s and 30s. I mean, like this, like, yeah, like this stuff's been around for a minute. Yeah. One of the key figures associated with its formulation was the Danish physicist Niels Bohr, who played a significant role in shaping the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics. Bohr, along with other physicists such as Werner Heisenberg, Max Born, and Wolfgang Pauli, among others, worked to establish the mathematical and conceptual framework of quantum mechanics. Their efforts led to the formulation of the uncertainty principle and the understanding that the act of measurement has a fundamental impact on quantum systems. Niels Bohr introduced the concept of wave function collapse and the observer effect. The formal discussions and writings on the observer effect emerged as part of the debates and dialogues surrounding the interpretation of quantum mechanics. Bohr's philosophical and interpretational views, particularly through the Copenhagen interpretation, emphasized the role of the observer and measurement in understanding quantum phenomena. The connection between the observer effect and metaphysical or consciousness related ideas began to emerge in the latter part of the 20th century as quantum physics concepts became more widely known and popularized. One notable book that played a significant role in popularizing the connection between quantum physics and metaphysics is The Tao of Physics by Fritjof Capra. I don't, Capra. 
published in 1975. While it does not explicitly mention the observer effect by name, the book explores parallels between Eastern mysticism, particularly Taoism, and modern physics, including quantum mechanics. It discusses concepts such as interconnectedness, the nature of reality, and the role of the observer in shaping reality. The Dancing Wuli Masters by Gary Zukov, published in 1979, is another influential book that made connections between quantum physics and metaphysics. It explores the philosophical implications of quantum mechanics and how they relate to consciousness, spirituality, and the observer's role in creating reality. So this is just to say pretty much everything in Ramtha's teachings has been said before, has been explored before, has been published and written about extensively before and in some of the other interviews i read from like former bodyguards and stuff like that just talked about her being a, a voracious reader with a photographic memory and that was very good at being able to read a book and then walk out on stage and channel ramtha for three hours and basically regurgitate the entire contents of the book but without crediting the author of course <laughs> i feel like it's very easy when you're studying quantum physics, especially if you're not someone who is a scientist, when you're learning about it sort of as a layperson, just embracing it like me. It's really easy to use it as a lens through which you view the world. So it makes complete sense to me that people were utilizing concepts of quantum mechanics and sort of viewing spirituality through that lens, because there's just a lot that it seems really really insightful and it seems really, really incredible. And that's because it is. Because again, quantum mechanics is absolutely incredible and it doesn't need to be mysticized at all. Yes. Yes. Like, it's that cool on its own, but it's so cool that like I have found it to be something that when I was learning about it, it gave me a lot of insight into life and, and everything around me because that's, you know, what you do as a person, you gain knowledge and it influences how you view the world. It's such a natural, organic extension of that, that the idea that she was like the first is so silly and stupid. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, after exiting the Ramtha School of Enlightenment, Jeff Knight noted that Jay-Z Knight was a voracious reader, always keeping abreast of new authors and new ideas, like you said, both to protect her IP and to develop Ramtha's messaging. So it's not that Jay-Z is psychic. She's just really well read. But that also downplays the importance of preaching and teaching. We don't expect a teacher to have invented or discovered what they're teaching us to value them as a teacher. Whether or not Jay-Z Knight is a good teacher is a different debate. Even if all of her messaging is based on previously published ideas, her interpretations of those ideas and the way that she teaches them have for a great many people added value to their life. And for that, that is what it is. You know, Just like any other religion that could be toxic or whatever, People use it and it brings them value and that in a vacuum, cool, whatever. What I kept thinking when I was researching the script was if you were trying to explain the concept of Jesus Christ to a five-year-old, it would sound just as ridiculous as what it sounds like when you describe what Ramtha is. Even that doomsday scenario that I read earlier that was excerpted from a really great essay about Jay-Z Knight, that whole script of it's the end times and you're the enlightened one, that all could also be in the book of Revelations. It, it, it's like, there's so much stuff in the Bible that is, sounds ridiculous and there's giants and they're mating with women and all of this kind of stuff. You know, there, there's so much stuff that sounds really silly when you just break it down to its essentials. Any any religion sounds ridiculous if it's not the one that you grew up indoctrinated into. Yeah. I included here uh, a clip from What the Bleep mm -hmm. in 2004. So you can hear the difference between Ramtha's first big public appearance on the Merv Griffin show and then this really captivating performance and appearance and what the bleep do we know and i can't emphasize enough this movie was like a hit for an independently produced movie like it did really well it screened in theaters and professors were showing it in classes so let's let's look it only takes one sexual fantasy for a man to have a hard on in other words it only takes one thought here 
for a man to have an erection in his member. And yet, there was nothing outside of him that gave him that. It was what was within him that gave him that. I'm not a huge fan of the weird 70s porno music playing behind that. Who produced that clip? Was that... Did she make that? Did she have creative control over how that was made? I I don't know to what extent she had creative control over the project. It was so horny. But it was... I mean, but that gives you like a sense of what the documentary was trying to do. We're going to make quantum physics like sexy. Yeah. But I, my first exposure to Jay-Z was someone came over and had the movie. At, like it, it, had, it had already been out for years, but they had torrented the, the like, oh, you you got to watch this. We were doing a lot of meth back then, by the way. <laughs> so that, that tells you like who, who, who the cheering section for the movie was. A lot of people were talking about it. Like, Oh, like you, you've got to see, it. it's going to change the way you view reality. And I saw that clip and I was obsessed with her. I was like, who the fuck is Ramtha? Like she got something, <laughs> she got something. Mm -hmm. And then at the end it says Ramtha. And then I go look it up and it's like, Oh no, that woman's name is Jay-Z Knight. And the Ramtha is supposedly a spirit she's channeling. And I was like, what? And then I realized, oh, I started doing more research around the documentary. And I was like, oh, this is just propaganda. Like this isn't based on anything. Like none of the science like tracks. Like mm -hmm. it's, it's just straight up bullshit science. Yeah, it's complete pseudoscience. Yeah. Yeah. So the documentary garnered a lot of attention and renewed interest in Jay-Z Knight and Ramtha and the School of Enlightenment. However, this attention didn't last as long as previous public ventures by Jay-Z Knight, in part because the internet and social media had changed the landscape. As soon as there was renewed attention on the school, there was criticism of it. Now, former students could go on message boards and forums, start websites, and tell their stories on social media. Further archival footage of Jay-Z Knight had been resurrected on YouTube, which allowed people to find inconsistencies in her teachings and presentation. Scientists were vocal in their criticism of the film and its reductionist approach to theories in their fields, which are still, well, theoretical. As a side note, one of the film's producers and directors, Mark Vicente, would go on to join the Nexium cult, another school promising self-actualization, and was the director of the documentary that exposed that school. Wow. In a testament to charisma, none of this impacted her ability to get students to her school, paying high tuition costs to master their psychic abilities and reach transcendence. She has also done civic good. She has contributed vast sums of money to the Democratic Party. She funds scholarships for local high school students in Yelm, and her company and school employ hundreds of locals. So the impact of her school on the local economy can't be understated. When a local 15-year-old girl wrote to Jay-Z Knight and told her that a couple, two of Ramtha's students, had coerced her into a sexual relationship, she invited the girl to an event. She brought the girl and the couple onto the stage, and there, Ramtha got them to confess to the crime in front of an audience of hundreds, and then the school contacted local police. Wow. So, you know. So she took a young girl who had been, how old was she? 15, who had essentially at least been statutory raped by adults yeah. who were followings of her teachings, which doesn't yeah. really matter. The fact is a young woman was victimized by two adults and yeah. her response was to make a spectacle of her and to have her, her abusers on stage with her describing re-traumatizing her the events that they did in front of the school with her right the fuck there so that they the police could come and arrest them and what she could have her fucking scooby-doo moment like what in the fuck that is one way to look at it at the same time there is something ingenious in using Ramtha to get them on stage and to get them to confess to their crime in front of a hundred plus witnesses. Oh so yeah. Once again, she's, she's taking over the narrative. She is yeah. in, getting in front of it, making Ramtha the hero, making, you know, everything about what a good job she did. And in front of everyone at the time, people weren't thinking about victims and trauma the way that we do now. 
So yeah. at the time, I bet this was absolutely positive press. And I bet however that 15-year-old girl felt at the time, she probably did not feel, I don't know, this is just guessing, maybe projecting. I doubt she felt comfortable expressing how fucked up that was for her. So I'm pretty yeah. sure, like probably guessing at the time, this was probably seen as like a big damn hero moment. I'm sure. In the early 2010s, the first real cracks in Jay-Z Knight's persona first started to emerge when a group of disgruntled former students released a video of Jay-Z Knight channeling Ramtha and apparently engaging in a drunken rant full of racism and anti-Semitism because don't they fucking always. It's, I, you know, it's... Tales it's all time. It's, 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 it's their fault, you know? Um, Look what they made them do. <laughs> Um, there no, I mean, I like, like, I'm, I'm so, I know so little about religion because the kind of oppressive oppressions that where I grew up were largely ethnic. Um, I didn't know what a Jewish was really until I moved to New York. Um, like, I obviously knew what Jews were and a little bit about the religion, but I didn't have any practical, like, real world experience of it until I lived in New York and I, <laughs> I had to have someone sit me down and I was like, can you, why do people hate Jews? Like, can you explain it to me? Like I'm five. Cause ex just explain it to me like a caveman. <laughs> like, and so my friend had to sit me down and he was like, okay, well, there were a bunch of banks and like, we, like we ran the banks and like, da, 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 like he like laid out, you know, he was like, man, this is like my whole like Hebrew school. <laughs> but like I had to have him break it down for me. Cause I, and one of my questions was like, why does every conspiracy theory end with the Jews? Yes. Like, I still it's, don't get it. I like my thing is like this is sort of like the Umberto Echo thing about, you know, you're in the presence of a madman when they start talking about the Knights Templar. And I think the other uh -huh. one is like, you know, you're dealing with a conspiracy theorist when they bring up the Jews, mm -hmm. like the minute, like, like you just like, oh, okay. So this is all leading to, you know? Yeah. You just wait for that shoe to drop basically. Aren't you part Jewish? Mm -hmm. Don't you have ancestry? I had Jewish in me for about four and a half years. <laughs> um. <laughs> But don't you have ancestry as well? Is yeah, I, I believe so. I believe I'm 23 and me, I think, has a little bit, but you know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I will say that I have prepared a goddamn impressive vegetarian Seder several times. <sighs> So there are over 30,000 hours of lectures given by Jay-Z Knight as Ramtha, and apparently one of the rituals at the School of Enlightenment are wine ceremonies. During these ceremonies, Ramtha drinks red wine, the only intoxicant that students are allowed to partake in. According to the rules, the students gathered to listen to Ramtha must drink whenever he does. That's a drinking game. Some mm -hmm. former students claim that these events devolve into drunken rants. Jay-Z Knight has claimed that this video was highly edited and taken out of context to make her appear to be saying horrible things. Okay, what was the original context, Jay Z? Well, I, I'm a comedian, so okay, I'm, I know I'm gonna, this is a hot gonna, issue. If I have a joke and the premise is like, so obviously I believe in murdering children. Like, let's say, let's say, like the like the premise of what I'm about to say is like I'm going to impersonate a Republican now, my version of a Republican, mm -hmm. uh, and then I start saying, you know. Yeah, no, like, well, if she's old enough to bleed, she's old enough to breed. Mm -hmm. da, 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 da. Now, if you took me doing that bit and took out the front part where I go, let me be a Republican, mm -hmm. and you just include the bit where I say the, the horrible thing, that could make me look really bad. Mm -hmm. Right? And so there's a part of me that goes like, I don't know. Like, if someone's giving three-hour-long lectures, I don't know if they're saying something because they're setting up their impersonating someone else they're creating a straw man for mm -hmm. an example they're about to give right. there are lots of ways that things said in a lecture could be chopped and screwed to look differently but i wasn't there and i don't know i, I think like, that's the I, rational seen... approach to take i think you're absolutely right 
and it's very easy to um, take information presented to you in a certain way and just decide that that is complete fact because it confirms, because of confirmation bias, you know? Yeah. Um, and when someone really is a huge piece of shit, you don't need to chop and screw the footage to to make them seem bad. They they just are. Just like if someone's yeah. really nice, they don't need to tell you so. And I hear what you're saying. And I think that what you're saying is absolutely correct. We should approach any content. This is media literacy, what you just said. We should keep in yeah. mind that what is presented to us isn't necessarily always the original context. And yeah. it's, yeah. It is possible, but it's also possible that she just said horrible shit. So yeah. Jay-Z Knight sued these students for violation of her intellectual property, and she won with them having to pay out a settlement for distributing the video, but the damage was done. Several Democratic candidates she had donated to returned their donations, and there was a nationwide coverage of the event. The video itself has been scrubbed from the internet, but I was able to find an archived news clip covering the ensuing scandal, which contains some of the clips. I'll play it now. First, it was Washington State Democrats. Now the Obama campaign is getting questions about the tens of thousands of dollars in donations it accepted from Yelm spiritualist Jay-Z Knight. Local Republicans are demanding that Democrats return the cash. Guy Ritz Evans Essex Porter is live in Seattle with a response from the president's campaign. Essex. And we're across the street from state Democratic headquarters where they tell us they will not be giving the night money back. So now we are asking the very same questions of the Obama campaign. When Jay-Z Knight donated to President Obama, she got this picture in return. She had her picture taken with the First Lady, too. Knight's critics don't believe the Obamas knew anything about this video. Don't you tell me that good Catholics Homosexual priests. She supposedly was channeling a 35,000 year old spirit called Ramtha. Records show Jay Z Knight has given at least $35,000 to the President and Democratic National Committee, another $60,000 to the Washington State Democratic Party. The head of the state Republican Party told us Democrats should give the money back. She attacks large segments of the population. A lot of Catholics and Jews and homosexuals in Washington State, I just don't think they should take the money. I think it's dirty. I also found court records, which are archived at enlightenmefree.com, which serves to document Jay-Z Knight's legal battles and other cult accusations and is run by former students of the School of Enlightenment. I'll share here a listing of the activities that take place at the Ramtha School of Enlightenment. Okay, but we're not doing that just yet because, of course, I have something to fucking say about that video. Um, Go for it. I'm so fucking... Okay, first of all, I'm getting very strong vibes, like recycling vibes from this. Like, everyone needs to be recycling more because of the environment and, like, putting, like, the onus on individuals and glossing over the fact that, like, huge corporations are responsible for all the shit that's going on. It's like... Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. She donated less than $100,000. We're having a whole conversation about this on airtime. Like it costs more per second to be on the air than she donated in total. And it's very fucking rich for any political person to be, you know, criticizing someone else's donations they're getting and how they should throw away the money. And it just feel like Democrats do this all the fucking time. They like Democrats are so quick to like self-flagellate and like, oh, well, we, you know, we reject that. It's like motherfuckers, you think the fucking Republicans aren't taking every bag given to them by people who like actively fucking hate everyone that's not cishet white dudes. And do you remember a time when like something like this made news? Like, can you imagine anyone having a conversation about like Trump's donations coming from someone who's at a a bad thing about Jews and gays? Oh, no. I mean, I I look at it like this was kind of the beginning of the end for her because what the bleep do we know came out and there were torrents and sharing sites and yeah, we had MySpace and things like that. But now this happened in the era of sort of Twitter really coming online and that super real time mm -hmm. ability to share information and spread things around. The fact that that video has been absolute, like I cannot find it. And I, I've looked in some dark places. I looked in dark places and I can't find it. 
this bitch might just be channeling a 35,000 year old spirit because bitch, I thought the internet was forever. Turns out, not if you're Jay-Z Knight. You can't find it. You can't, you cannot find it. Mm-hmm. It's, you can't find it. It's it, nowhere. That's, right. that's wild to, that she got actually managed to get something scrubbed from the internet is wild. That is fucking wild in this day that's and a, age. That's a superpower. That's a superpower. Yeah. Like people are like, oh, I would, I would be invisible. I would fly. I would be able to read people's minds. I'd be like, I would be able to make anything disappear from the internet. That would be my superpower. So this listing of techniques and practices that we're about to read through, I culled from legal documents. So I found the court transcripts from one of the many lawsuits filed against her by former students and was able to find this testimony where they just did a pretty frank breakdown of what takes place at the school and how it's implemented and how that contributes to a cult-like environment. Right. Okay. So this is, this is quoted testimony. So secret techniques and practices. Among the techniques taught in the compound that I witnessed and endured were pagan dance, blue body dance, rock work, paradise beach, drinking a lye seawater concoction. That doesn't sound like a dance anymore. Field work, field run, the tank, blue body dance, candle focus, CNE, the Christ walk, and wine ceremony. Features of these techniques included extreme physical exertion. They were often for very long periods of time, blindfolding and other disorienting techniques, deprivations of food, water, rest, and access to bathrooms. I described these techniques in more detail below. CNE, hyperventilating and screaming, alleged warrior cries, to deafening music with Ramtha, shouting cult indoctrination slogans for up to eight hours at a time. Field work, a technique where devotees are blindfolded whilst walking around a horse paddock looking for a card placed on a fence. Sometimes there would be over 1,000 participants, including adults and children. These techniques can last up to 12 hours without breaks, during which time I witnessed and heard participants being knocked to the ground. For advanced groups, the sessions would go through the night through rain and snow, causing devotees to catch colds and the flu. Blue body dance. During this technique, devotees draw web designs with a blue indelible pen on their bodies wherever there was an injury or disease. A dance routine was choreographed by Judith Knight performing as Ramtha on stage. Ramtha claimed that the technique and discipline would heal every conceivable disease and extend life beyond our genetic expectancy. This was done blindfolded by very loud trance music until total exhaustion. Field run. This technique involved a process of running at each other while blindfolded in a fenced horse paddock. Up to 500 children and adults are lined up on opposite sides of the paddock and told to run at each other. Carnage ensued. Staff and participants are ordered not to assist the injured. However, I witnessed many that were taken to the hospital with serious injuries. This one has been coming up a lot, the the field run, and I don't understand that one at all. It just sounds so needlessly. Imagine, uh, basically imagine a football field, the opening of a football game where they all run at each other. But now imagine they're blindfolded and don't have helmets. Mm-hmm. And, and there's 500 of them. And they're just told to run full force. Yeah. Knowing they're going to collide with each other. And then what? I if don't they, know. If they, these are meant <clears throat> to develop your skills of clairvoyance, oh. focus, clairaudience. Okay. So you get it. You if you were it. good, if you were actually doing a good job, then you wouldn't run into anyone at all. So you need to try it again until you master it. Yes. And stop yep. hurting yourself. Yes. Wow. And you had to conquer the fear, the fear of, of impact. Jesus fucking Christ. So there's more. The Christ walk. Participants are made to walk very slowly up and down a large field for many hours, speaking an, an internal mantra such as, I am a fully Christ being realized. I am my greater God. I live in the now. My past is complete. From the Lord God of my being, I am healed. These walks would last for hours and it was forbidden to stop until ordered to by Ramtha. Paradise Beach. This technique would last one to three days outdoors without a tent, blindfolded. Participants are not allowed to eat food and have to make their way to toilets with permission, blindfolded. Later, tents were introduced and participants were blindfolded up to five days and could not leave the tent or speak to anyone. The tank. 
This technique took place in a giant arena. Devotees, including children, pregnant women, and adults, are blindfolded and must find, sometimes fight, their way through an eight-foot-high maze to a hidden room at the center where food and water are made available. Selected participants were allowed entry under Judith Knight's instructions through a secret panel that was open for selected participants. Parentheses, cult grooming. The technique also included climbing over walls with ladders and dropping off the other side, eight feet, while blindfolded. Also moving through tubes, three feet in diameter, where bodies became stuck in the chaos and desperation. Sometimes the 90 degree heat in summer, along with fainting, screaming, and urinating in the tubes made this unbearable. Oh my Nightmare God. Nightmare fuel. Yeah. Nightmare fuel. Fuck. Yeah. Wine ceremonies. These sessions involve more than 12 hours, nonstop binge alcohol nightclub events that lasted until dawn. Devotees are often threatened and humiliated. Reformed alcoholics are told to drink. Judith Knight has been videoed in at least one such ceremony using religious, racial, and violent hate speech. Pipe tobacco smoking. I've seen and posted videos on YouTube which show participants being encouraged to smoke pipes during the Ramtha wine ceremonies, often from dusk till dawn. Pagan dance. Dancing till exhaustion to loud music wearing a face mask of an animal. Candle focus. Sitting up straight with no movement for up to eight hours staring at two candles on stage. Participants are woken if they fall asleep. Rock work. Participants sit blindfolded for many hours attempting to push a rock into the top of their skull to direct lower energy upward through the chakras, a yoga term meaning any of the seven major energy centers in the body, to an expanded state of consciousness at the top of the head. This was done to very loud music with Judith Knight shouting, push, push, and hold. Many participants would bleed from the top of the head. I was always left with thundering headaches, which were explained away as consciousness expanding to overcome pain and awaken the kundalini, the vital force lying dormant within one until activated by the practice of yoga, which leads one towards spiritual power and eventual salvation. Drinking lie seawater. Devotees were instructed to drink a secret formulation promoted by Judith Knight as a magical healing elixir of life and enhancement to enlightenment. The concoction of dead sea water mixed with red devil lye tasted awful. The dangerous practice has been reported in the news and reported to the authorities by a medical doctor. Fuck. That's just straight up, like, that's just poisoning. That's just poisoning people. I... I I'm not a psychiatrist or a psychologist, but this sounds a little bit like sadism. Yeah. Very much um, so. Especially, especially encouraging people to drink poison. And to like forcibly harm their heads until they bleed. Yeah. And then telling them that the ensuing pain was just spiritual growth. Yeah. Wow. Discipline was enforced by cult guards who were called the Red Guards and or the Generals. The Red Guards enforced what was like a military-style boot camp environment. Extreme bullying tactics were commonplace with physical assaults, threats of expulsion without a refund if Ramtha or the financial schemes promoted by Judith Knight or her teaching techniques were questioned. Often Judith Knight as Ramtha would verbally abuse individuals, which was regarded as a mark of significance and higher teaching from Ramtha. The cult explained that these techniques were necessary to help one overcome the physical and mental limitations of our human emotions, fears, and judgments to become spiritually enlightened. I myself experienced extreme exhaustion, disorientation, thundering headaches, and other ailments, including deep psychological harm. Once again, this is testimony. Many people suffered physical injuries, such as broken bones and nervous breakdowns. The techniques were extremely exhausting and disorienting and had the result of placing me into an altered state of consciousness. In this state, my normal psychological defenses were broken down. Assisting any of the members injured during the techniques resulted in immediate expulsion without a refund. I became susceptible to suggestion and manipulation. I've since learned that the techniques used by the cult are commonly used by cults to create an atmosphere of coercive persuasion or brainwashing. These techniques had the effect of A, keeping me unaware that there was an agenda to control or change the me and my thoughts. That is... Direct yeah, quote. this is testimony and it's from a person from New Zealand. So some of the spelling is and word order is a little slightly different. Okay, so uh, keeping me unaware that there was an agenda to control and change me and my thoughts. B, controlling time and physical environment. C, creating a sense of powerlessness, fear and dependency. D, suppressing old behavior and attitudes. E, instilling new behavior and attitudes. And F, 
putting forth a closed system of logic. I mean, it sounds like a hazing. It does. It really it's does. A lot. But on the other hand, you could see similar complaints coming from CrossFit or Bikram Yoga or hiking Machu Picchu. I hiked Machu Picchu and every year on that trail, people are severely injured and even die. When I lived in Williamsburg, I did work study at a Bikram and would take sometimes two or three classes in a single day, chasing wellness and a better body. None of these practices are safe or recommended. Doing yoga in a room heated to over 100 degrees is inherently unsafe, but people line up to do it every day. All of this is to say that spiritual or health practices aren't inherently safe or advisable. The court documents never mention if Jay-Z Knight or Ramtha ever demonstrated their ability to complete these tasks perfectly as an ascended master. It seems like it would be an easy enough test and thoroughly impressive. What struck me as I was reading all this testimony was like, did anyone ever ask Ramtha to demonstrate his ability to do these things that they're right. being asked to do? Right. No mention of it. No. Which to me is crazy because that seems like first principles, right? Right. Well, why don't you why don't you show me how to push the rock through my head? Can you yeah. do it first? Yeah. Why don't you show me how to run a clot across the field blindfolded and not can can you show me what it looks like when it's done successfully? These seem like really basic, basic questions. They do, but if you imagined the sort of headspace someone's in when they're there, they've already paid money to be there. This is something that they have paid for. And so they're already positioned to, they want to buy into it. It's kind of like the sunk cost fallacy. Like you're already yeah. there and it's just applied to like sadomasochistic degrees. Yeah. That's wild. I agree. So getting back to the scrubbed video. So I've struggled to find the transcript of the video. I was able to find a few articles that summarize what she said. So this is from the Southern Poverty Law Center. And um, when you're being written up by Southern Poverty Law Center, you know you don't fucked up. <laughs> like. Yeah. Sis. Yeah. <laughs> Take a seat. Yeah. God don't like ugly. <laughs> okay. So this, this, this is a quote. During the 16 or so hours the students spend in a spiritual drinking game, students must drink every time Ramtha Knight does. Knight will disparage Catholics, gay people, Mexicans, organic farmers, and Jews. Quote, fuck God's chosen people. I think they have earned enough cash to have paid their way out of the goddamn gas chambers by now. Unquote. She says, as members of the audience snicker. There are also titters when she declares Mexicans, quote, breed like rabbits, unquote, and are, quote, poison, unquote, that all gay men were once Catholic priests and that organic farmers have questionable hygiene. Mm. Okay, so while Jay-Z Knight was successful in her lawsuit to suppress the videos, the hit to her reputation was palpable, at least socially. A lot of the celebrities that had endorsed her quietly slipped away. Eventually, all those Democratic candidates and groups did return her donations. She was persona non grata. She still had her students and her school, however. But this is our girl Jay-Z, and she's like water. God, I just saw the title of the next <laughs> section. Um, I saved it for you. It seems that like most people that find themselves canceled, she found refuge in the night. No, in the right, which, okay. <laughs> <laughs> the alt-right and QAnon. This is, you're, you're doing this to me. You're doing this. Yeah. To, you're making me talk about, I have a hard, hard boundary in place. Uh, <gasps> greater people than you can't make me do this, but okay, <laughs> here we are. QAnon is a far right conspiracy theory and online community that emerged in late 2017. It uh, originated from an anonymous online persona called Q, who claimed to have insider knowledge of a global conspiracy against US President Donald Trump and his supporters. QAnon followers believe in a range of unfounded and baseless claims, including the existence of a deep state working to undermine Trump, a global pedophilia ring involving prominent individuals, an impending storm that would expose and dismantle the alleged conspiracy. Uh, the conspiracy theory gained traction through online platforms and social media, attracting a significant following of individuals who interpret and disseminate Q's cryptic messages. QAnon supporters often engage in Q drops, which are posts purportedly made by Q and elaborate on their intentions through uh, forums, websites, and social media channels. 4chan. QAnon's influence and visibility grew, with supporters participating in real-world events such as rallies and protests. 
The movement has been associated with promoting misinformation, false narratives, and divisive beliefs. It has also been linked to incidents of violence and harassment. January fucking 6th was yeah. one. I think I... um. I remember when QAnon hit the adult industry and suddenly mm -hmm. there were several kind of right-wing adult performers really started posting a lot of the Save the Children, the crazy statistics about number of children going missing each year, which if accurate would mean that literally millions of people, millions of children were disappearing from the United States every single day. I mean, it, it just like, it does stuff that just math, math, the math just doesn't math. And yeah. of all people, adult film people should be the first to understand how complicated, convoluted and, and misconstruing statistics about trafficking can be. When I saw that people that should absolutely know better on a visceral level getting sucked into it, I knew that it was kind of a big deal. Yeah. You yeah. know, it's a it's a fucking lot. Yeah. I mean, people lose family members. There's there's whole support groups for people whose families have been cued. Yes. Um, are. But I don't want to dally too much on it. So mm -hmm. QAnon has promoted several conspiracy theories, many of which are unsubstantiated and lack credible evidence. But here are some of the prominent theories associated with QAnon. Deep state conspiracy. QAnon followers believe in the existence of a deep state within the U.S. government, which they claim is a secret network of individuals working to undermine President Trump and his administration. They allege that this deep state is composed of powerful elites, politicians, and bureaucrats. Pizzagate. QAnon played a significant role in promoting the baseless Pizzagate conspiracy theory. It claimed that high-ranking Democrats, including Hillary Clinton, were involved in a child sex trafficking ring operating out of a pizza restaurant in Washington, D.C., this theory led to a 2016 incident where an armed individual entered the restaurant believing the conspiracy to be true. Global pedophilia ring. QAnon promotes the belief in a widespread global pedophilia ring involving prominent individuals from various sectors, including politics, entertainment, and business. Followers claim that President Trump is fighting against these pedophiles and that a great awakening will occur, leading to the exposure and punishment of those involved. The storm. QAnon followers anticipate a moment called the storm, which refers to a future event in which President Trump will expose and dismantle the alleged deep state conspiracy. They believe this event will involve mass arrests, military tribunals, and re the restoration of power to those deemed loyal to the Trump administration. Q drops and symbolism. QAnon followers analyze and interpret posts called Q drops made by the anonymous figure known as Q. These posts contain vague statements, questions, and references to events or individuals. Followers engage in extensive speculation and attempt to connect the dots, often using numerology, symbolism, and hidden meanings to construct narratives. If you remember that narrative about intergalactic war and gray men from earlier, it's easy to see how some of QAnon's tenets line up nicely with New Age ideas about the nature of reality and the power of symbols such as numbers, colors, and so on. The New Age to QAnon pipeline refers to a phenomenon where individuals who were previously involved in New Age spirituality or alternative wellness practices transition into embracing QAnon conspiracy theories. While not everyone who follows New Age beliefs or practices becomes involved in QAnon, there have been observed patterns of individuals moving from one worldview to the other. The pipeline is often attributed to a convergence of factors, including a distrust of mainstream institutions, a search for alternative narratives, and a desire for answers and meaning. Some individuals who were initially drawn to New Age ideas such as spirituality, consciousness expansion, or alternative healing modalities may find themselves susceptible to QAnon's conspiratorial worldview due to shared elements such as the belief in hidden knowledge, secret cabals, and a sense of being part of a chosen group fighting against evil forces. The shift from New Age to QAnon can occur through various pathways. It may involve exposure to QAnon content through social media algorithms, online communities, or personal connections. Additionally, some prominent figures within the New Age community have endorsed or promoted QAnon-related ideas, blurring the lines between the two movements. One of those figures is Jay-Z Knight. After her court case and public shaming in 2015, she re-emerged in 2019, this time as a proponent of QAnon. From an article that ran in the Daily Beast, in 2019 by Will Summer. But I just real quick before we dive yes. into that, mm -hmm. I feel like the a commonality in people who are susceptible to these things is feeling like, like the world that they once understood, it doesn't make sense anymore. And that the place that they once felt comfortable in society and in the world suddenly is being painted as villainy in a way that they 
are caught off guard by and un sort of edified by. And so they want to find something that reinforces the idea that they're actually very, very good people um, and that, you know, the systems through which a lot of their contemporaries have crafted injustice in the world is, you know, beyond them. And so sort of reacting to that, they want a movement that makes them feel special, that makes them feel important, that makes them feel seen and heard and appreciated and sort of accepted exactly as they are. And this offers that to them. With the New Age movement, it's so special. It's so it's a personal connection to something bigger than you, to the world, the universe, to Ramtha. It's taking you, little old you, just everyday you, and making you a some unique, sparkling thing in the universe with greater meaning. And it connects you to something bigger than yourself. And I think that we can see that in QAnon, wanting to feel connected to something bigger than themselves, but stripping away the spirituality of it. Now, instead of Ramtha speaking through a celebrity woman, you just have a celebrity that people are sort of putting into every narrative that they want to. Well, it's also it's also just community. It you is. Know, I think that a lot of people that fell into QAnon are older and they found community on Facebook. And a lot of people that enter into middle age and beyond, if their kids have gone off to school, if they feel isolated, but they don't go to church. My parents are both in recovery. So they have a lot of community because they go to NA meetings like several times a week. And so that has fostered and created like community for them. Right. Mm -hmm. And a, a place where they belong and they feel valued. And I think that people that are isolated and hurting really respond to anything that provides community. It's the same way that like white supremacists are able to get people involved. And even looking at the stuff about Ramtha and the students that had exited the school, they knew it was kind of a fraud pretty quickly. But what kept them there was all the friends they had made and their sense of belonging. It can't be understated that like the real crisis, you know, in this country is loneliness. Right. And especially now as the left has is really going through some birthing pains around trans issues, around Roe v. Wade, around sex work. Like it's for older people, it's like it's very rapidly changing world around them. But also on the left, we tend to be scolds, mm -hmm. right? And yes. so um, it's even hard to maintain a sense of community on the left because there's so much infighting and backbiting and puritanical kind of thinking. And so a lot of people that are starting to exit the left and sit somewhere more in the center describe experiences of even just being alone with their thoughts and being like, did I have an impure thought? Did I have a racist thought? Did I have a sexist thought? When you've got someone to that level of scrutinizing their own thought processes, it's, it's creating an environment that someone's going to want to escape at some point. I think that there's two things were happening at the same time, which is like the left to be really contracting around people like a boa constrictor, like just mm -hmm. around and around and nothing's good enough and nothing's. And there's this desire for like moral authority. Right. You know, yes. pretty much all of society is based on this idea of moral authority. Whoever has the moral authority is right. Mm hmm is whatever and so you see all these people like jockeying for moral authority and the new age pipeline QAnon, those are all giving people access to moral authority because right. save the children we have Absolutely. to save the children you know like we're trying to save the children i mean that gives me moral authority over anybody else you know so i think it's also that that quest Right. And to speak to that, it is it is a lot of older people and a lot of boomers and a lot of the things that they were raised saying, speaking, just the, the way that they talk about things that even they might be trying to be on the right side of, but they get exhausted trying to learn how to talk about things correctly. And we are very quick to scold and to tell people that they're wrong and that they're everything that's wrong with the world. And when people start to really like hear that a lot, now the act of rebellion is being like leaning into bigotry. Now that's reclaiming, now that's standing up to an institution is just doubling down 
and then you've got this higher mission to save the children from being raped by everyone who you don't like. So it doesn't matter that like all of that stuff doesn't matter. Like, how could you care about the way that I talk about, you know, these issues that I'm completely unfamiliar with while children are being raped by these people and you're doing nothing about it? It's sort of like what about ism on a yeah. high level? Anyway. Yeah. So and um, I, I've, yeah, mm-hmm. I'm going to be quoting from this article from the Daily Beast just because it is good. So quote, since February, at least three top QAnon promoters have made plans to visit a sprawling Washington state property owned by Jay-Z Knight, a new age guru whose former acolytes have accused her of running a cult. Since last year, Knight has begun to incorporate the anonymous online clues left by the anonymous QAnon into her romp the lore. In one statement from Ramtha provided to the Daily Beast by Knight's group, the Ramtha School of Enlightenment, the spirit declares that the person behind QAnon is, quote, a divine intelligence, unquote. Quote, it is challenging the entire world and the evil network in every country and taking them down, the statement praising QAnon reads. Quote, Knight's embrace of QAnon marks the latest bizarre evolution for the conspiracy theory, which has appeared everywhere from Trump rallies to the White House, where the president posed for a picture with a QAnon leader. The conspiracy theory has also been tied to two murders. Like other QAnon promoters, Knight has begun to make merchandise based on the conspiracy theory, selling hats and t-shirts with Q branding. Knight has also tried to use QAnon to sell copies of her book, claiming that QAnon clues are actually signs that people should read her great book. Knight has found a friendly reception with some top QAnon promoters who have started flocking to the groups, the ranch property in Yelm, Washington for QAnon intensive events. JT Wilde, a singer who writes QAnon theme songs like WWG1, WGA, which is short for where we go one, we go all, appears to have been the first QAnon personality to make a public appearance at the ranch. In March, Wilde appeared at Knight's Genesis retreat, performing his QAnon songs at events with names like Orb Session. Wilde, who didn't respond to requests for comment, isn't the only QAnon personality on the ranch's agenda this year. In June, pseudonymous QAnon promoters, The Matrix and Shady Groove, who have more than 110,000 Twitter followers between them, are scheduled to appear in June at the ranch to discuss their QAnon theories. Knight's followers looking to see the QAnon interpreters will have to pay $100 each for tickets. You're paying $100 for tickets to people who have 110,000 followers between them? A hundred dollars. I know. I like, I know, like, I forget what that for normal people, that's a lot of followers. That's like, you couldn't, they couldn't even get like a sponsorship from a makeup brand for a hundred dollars. I mean, hats off to the, to the con. QAnon's new ties to Romp that have opened up a split among QAnon believers, many of whom fear associating with people who believe in an ancient warrior spirit will make QAnon believers look ridiculous. The feud over Ramtha broke into the open last week when a QAnon blogger named Neon Revolt blasted Wild in the Matrix and Shady Groove in a blog post for booking appearances at the ranch. I would like to point out that since this article was written, the identity of Q has been revealed and far from being a divine intelligence, well, yeah. The documentary filmmaker Colin Hoback spent three years investigating the origins of QAnon and its connection to 8chan, conducting extensive interviews with Jim and Ron Watkins. In the last episode of Q, Into the Storm, the 2021 HBO docuseries he produced from this research, Hoback showed his final conversation with Ron Watkins, who stated on camera, I spent the past almost 10 years every day doing this kind of research anonymously. Now I'm doing it publicly. That's the only difference. It was basically three years of intelligence training, teaching normies how to do intelligence work. It was basically what I was doing anonymously before, but never as Q. Watkins then laughed and added, never as Q. I promise, because I am not Q and I never was. Hoback viewed this as an inadvertent omission by Watkins and concluded from this interview and his other research that Watkins is Q. Watkins again denied being Q shortly before the series premiered. On February 19th, 2022, the New York Times reported that analysis of the Q post by two independent forensic linguistics teams using stylometry techniques indicated that Paul Ferber was the main author of the initial Q posts and Ron Watkins took over in 2018. Ferber said Q's writing style had influenced his own, not the other way around. If you don't know those names, they're all fucking neckbeards from 4chan with no knowledge of anything. It was a big fucking troll. It was nothing. It was stupid. It was bullshit. And it was very much like the Trump presidency. And it was all fucking 
wild. It always comes down to like some fucking disgruntled neck beard, doesn't it? <sighs> Fuck me in the tits, <laughs> like, Jesus. It always comes down to like a man not getting his dick sucked. Oh my God. It really goddamn does. <laughs> hey, just have sex. Yeah. Come on. So where is Jay-Z Knight today? The Romp the School of Enlightenment is still up and running and holding events around the world. Jay-Z lives in her sprawling estate in Yelm, Washington, surrounded by her followers. She is in semi-retirement at the age of 77, but she's still as beautiful and charismatic as ever. If you go to the School of Enlightenment website, they still offer classes and lectures, both virtually and in person. The directives of the school remain the same as they always have. You are God. You create your reality to make known the unknown. The only change is the advisement that if you've had to take the COVID vaccine for any reason, you not attend in-person events. Their latest thing that they believe in is the idea of vaccine shedding. Oh, right, right, right. So if you're vaccinated, which is then not, which is not real. That's it's not a thing. That's not it's something not that thing. happens. It's, it's not a thing, guys. No, it's not. Um, it's it's bullshit, and it is not factual, and it's not shocking. Um, that it's always it's the COVID vaccine. It's that one. It's that one. Like yeah, none none of the other ones. Just that one. Yeah. I don't have a lot of analysis to offer or I have too much, but I will say this. I was listening to a podcast featuring Jay-Z Knight that was recorded in 2016 and what she talks about growing up poor and neglected and what she talks about the impact of that on her life and describes the feeling of, quote, not being important to anyone, unquote, as being crushing. Regardless of whether you believe that a person can channel a spirit like Ramtha or control reality. A little girl that was brutally raped and grew up in poverty, never feeling like she was special to anyone, used everything she had to invent a new reality for herself in which she was a divine channel and turned into an astonishing level of personal wealth. And she is important and special to thousands of people. And that is just as miraculous as any entity. According to Ramtha, we have until 2042 to prepare for the Great Awakening Intergalactic War. Jay-Z Knight has stated that no one will succeed her. When she dies, Ramtha will go with her. She has recorded over 30,000 hours of lectures and talks that will serve to guide students after she passes on. And that is Jay-Z Knight. Wow. So sources for today's episode were Jay-Z Knight's Wikipedia page, uh, Ramtha Ryald from the Southern Poverty Law Center, shocking allegations from former Jay-Z Knight follower from Fox 13, the ancient spirit that settled in small town Washington, Seattle Met, Obscenity's video by Jay-Z Knight causes political storm. KRO7 News Seattle. QAnon teams up with alleged cult leader Jay-Z Knight. The Daily Beast. EnlightenMeFree.com. And uh, her biography, her memoir, A State of Mind, My Story. Ramtha, The Adventure Begins. The Audible Audio Edition. You can get on Amazon.com. Um, your hosts have been me, Sovereign Sire, and Ella Darling. This episode was written by me, Sovereign Sire. This episode was produced and edited by Joshua Anderson. And all media clips used in this episode were done so under fair use. Links to sources will be included in the notes for this episode. If you enjoyed today's episode, please subscribe, rate, and review us wherever you get your podcasts. Thank Any you so thoughts? much for listening. My closing thoughts, I feel like I popped off every fucking which way, every step of the way. So um, if you're a badass bitch... Don't do what this person did because this was not badass, <laughs> but she did it. You can't, there's no denying she did those things. She, I mean, she's just fascinating to me. Um, she's so charismatic and it's a great con. It's just, it's got originality. It's got endurance. It's plastic. It's malleable. It's labile. It's like water just it's it's like the bruce lee of gimmicks it <laughs> not to look not to praise but you gotta appreciate a cult run by a woman where they're not marrying babies and they're well, not like she was raped when she was four so what was not going on was her telling young children to marry old men and basically just allow themselves to be raped yeah. And I like seeing that that didn't happen. I mean, there's a whole, I could have gone a whole sideways. I mean, this episode altogether will probably be like four hours. So there were places I just couldn't go. Mm -hmm. 
But I did find a really interesting academic paper talking about Jay-Z Knight and comparing her to Catherine of Siena and other female mystics and talking about whether or not women are allowed to have access to the divine or if they're always accused of fraud and witchcraft. And I think that is something interesting to explore in another episode, but like whether or not women are allowed to be uh, spiritual leaders and if they kind of face different types of scrutiny, like would people be scrutinizing? I mean, Benny Hinn had to be doing a lot of crazy shit to get criticized in the way that Jay-Z was with a very small following where she's not asking people to throw their cancer medication on the DS to prove they're healed or any of the other things that Benny Hinn did and the millions and millions and millions of dollars that he swindled out of people. She has said, I'm not a guru. I run a business. This is a business. The business is self-actualization and helping you get there, but this is a business. So there is a side of her that's very, um, straightforward, which I also found unusual in her willingness to go to court, her litigiousness, Mm -hmm. like all of it. I mean, there's, it's just, I, I will never get the chance to, but I would really love to spend a week with her and write a profile on her because I think she's just fascinating. Um, There's a frankness and earnestness about her hustle in that she described it. She said it's a business. She was litigious. She called Rantha her intellectual property. There's, I mean, a lot of it through a, a certain lens, you could really just observe her as a performer really committed to the bit, just yeah. extreme method acting with moments of complete lucidity where she's acknowledging everything. She's not lying about it. I mean, I'm sure she was. Yeah. I'm sure she pl- lied about it plenty. But that framework, that like, I mean, I'm maybe I'm re- I'm relating to this as a hoe because yeah. when you spend money to access time with me, when you pay by the minute to speak to me, you have to know that that is performative and transactional, that the things said in that space are sort of, uh, there's a a suspension of disbelief present, you know? So like I have made a career out of a lot of people thinking I'm their girlfriend, but not really, you know? Yeah. But some of those people could very easily buy into it and feel just as swindled as someone who felt like they, you know, were being spiritually led by this entity I yeah. guess I'm just saying that like part of it, I guess I'm maybe a hit dog will holler kind of and I'm feeling a little of my own guilt around it or, or I, I don't know. I guess what I'm saying is that the whole point of this podcast is that I support women's rights, but I also support women's wrongs. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. That's okay. I uh, think perfect. I think we're good. I All right. We're, yeah, that's an episode. This is good. Thank you. Yeah, we did this it. Great. Meow. Meow. Oh, look at us go. Okay. Look at us go. All right. Okay, I'm going to stop. <laughs> <laughs>